Who is Christ? Boy, you'll get a lot of different answers depending on who you ask. A lot of people have a different view of who Jesus Christ is. You can watch the Discovery Channel and pretty sure you'll get a bad answer on that one. Or the History Channel. Um, or downtown Portland, who is Jesus Christ? You'll get a, you oftentimes a weird answer down there. Um, it reminds me there in Matthew, you know, when Matthew, uh, in the gospel of Matthew, Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? And man, the disciples gave a list. Some say you're Jeremiah the prophet. Others say you're, you know, uh, Elijah the prophet. Others say you're that prophet. Um, but then Jesus said, yeah, but who do you say that I am? And that's the operative, that's the important question, isn't it? Who do you say that Jesus Christ is? And, and your response to that question is kind of important. Um, it's amazing to me the um, crazy things people say about Jesus, that he was married. You know, you'll hear people say, if you were a Da Vinci Code uh, person, uh, he was married to Mary Magdalene and had children and stuff like that. That's uh, just people making stuff up zero evidence, zero, just people saying dumb things. Um, but we, we were so thankful because, you know, we don't have to speculate. You don't have to read the latest books on who was Jesus Christ, the authentic Jesus or um, the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the right Jesus, because we have our Bibles in hand. If you want to know who Jesus is, all you have to do is look to your Bible. Forget the college professors and the book writers and the history, uh, you know, uh, ex experts, so-called. Um, so if you want to find out who Jesus Christ is, just read your Bible. Now, one of the greatest enemies of the truth about Jesus, I believe, is found in modern day academia. Colleges, universities, what have you. And sadly, uh, if you're a mom or dad sending your kid off to college, you think, well, I'm sending my kid to a Christian college. Well, can I just caution you? Uh, some of those are more dangerous. I'd, I'd almost rather see a kid go to U of O because at least we know what you're getting. You're gonna get an atheist who hates the Bible and hates Jesus, and at least we know where they're coming from. But these Christian universities and their so-called theological experts and professors and what have you, I think they're the ones the Bible talks about professing themselves to be wise, they become fools, some of them. There's a lot of good professors, don't get me wrong, uh, but I, I just tend to bump into um, some of the worst of them in my own studies, but also seeing some of the kids in our, our uh, church, they come back and say, Brett, man, you'll never believe what they're teaching over at this school or what they're saying over at that college. And, and I'm always shocked to hear. Uh, one professor I heard just last Sunday, one of our students here at Athey, they said, man, our professor refuses to call God um, in the he gender. Um, and this is at a local school here. You know, it's, it, to me, that's heart, heartbreaking. Uh, the Bible tells us who God the Father is, and the Bible's very clear on uh, what Jesus Christ claimed to be and what, who he was. So all you need is the Bible. I love that. Historically, there's never been one thing in the Bible proven wrong. There's nothing that's questionable. It's infallible. It's inspired. It's the perfect word of God. I'm so thankful for that. Um, you know, uh, plenty of first century churches and ancient manuscripts uh, show evidence of who Jesus is. But, you know, it's amazing that even the, uh, you know, Biblical Archaeological Review and some of these other so-called academic institutions, you know, for the longest time, they try to say, well, Jesus is largely an invention of the fifth century, or, they, you know, they say certain things like that. And then I love how archaeological digs actually prove that to be wrong. Um, you know, uh, one of the great finds in, in Israel in the past 10 years was they found a um, under a prison in, in Israel, of all places. They were going to expand the prison, so they were digging, and they found this um, old church from the first century. So this is a, a church, a Christian church within the first century. But the, the thing that was so great about the find there was that there were mosaics on the floor. You know, the little pictures that they make of, of, with the little stones and colors, beautiful mosaics from those times. But um, the mosaics of this floor perfectly depicted the gospel narrative as it is in our, in our Bibles, and it's from the first century. Just again, proving all those, well, the, Jesus really is an invention of the fifth century. Never, he never existed before that. It's just, you know, an invention. No, uh, watch out for the so-called experts. Now, the reason I say that is because the smartest guys in Jerusalem are going to turn out to be um, totally misguided. Uh, and I would argue tonight what we're going to see is the God of intellect 
and people that are willing to worship the God of intellect before they'll worship the true and living God. Watch out for that. Um, sometimes the smartest guys in the room are the most misguided and the most wrong. Um, boy, isn't it funny how we've kind of seen that more than ever in our culture today? Where some of the smartest people, or at least they should be, you know, people that you, we maybe even trusted a few years ago, uh, some of the smartest people in the world, scientists. Man, I love science, but should we trust the so-called science that we're seeing today that's being guised as sort of science, but not really uh, the same? Um, the scientific method, I love that. Whatever happened to that? Proving stuff, testing things. It's a great idea. Um, by the way, who came up with the scientific method? Christians. Um, it's funny how the secular world tries to act like science is, belongs to the secular atheist and Christians are just uh, check their science card in at the door. No, it's actually quite the opposite these days. That's why nobody trusts anymore, you know, the World Health Organization or the climate change specialists. Uh, there's too many different, if you missed our prophecy update last week, did you see NBC uh, put out an article that the earth is, the, the rotation of the earth is slowing. And um, everybody's saying it's because of climate change and our, the way we're treating the earth, the earth is slowing. Um, the same day CBS put an article out, uh, CBS News, the earth is slowly speeding up. Uh, <laughs> they didn't, they didn't uh, check their notes one with another before they spewed their stupidity. Um, man, uh, as it turns out, uh, that's the way a lot of this tends to be, just so-called science, falsely so-called, that is. And it's something that's sad to me because I love science. S true science has only confirmed what the Bible actually says over the centuries. But all that to say, when it comes to Jesus, this is uh, the most important of doctrines, understanding who Jesus Christ is. Now, the setting for this in chapter seven, if you, guys, if you recall from last week, we, um, we are now around the Feast of, the ta of Tabernacles. Um, now, there's three main feasts. There's more, but the, the reason I call them main feasts, there were three feasts of the Jews that the, the Jewish men were compelled to go to Jerusalem, those, those uh, three feasts each year. Um, they'd travel to Jerusalem for the first main one is the Passover, um, then uh, 50 days later, the Feast of Pentecost, if you recall, we've studied these feasts in previous times. But the third of these feasts would be the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, now, the Feast of Tabernacles, by the way, um, that's where Jesus is going to be during John chapter 7. Um, he's going to be in the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, what is the Feast of Tabernacles? It's, it's a little bit kind of like our Thanksgiving. Um, the Jews like the Feast of Tabernacles because it's a fun one. Uh, everybody looked forward to it. It was celebratory. You got to eat good food, but you also would set up tents. Um, we call them tents. Um, uh, Sukkot, as they call it in Hebrew. Um, but it's like a big nationwide camping trip. They set up um, lean-tos or uh, palm-covered little uh, houses, temporary houses. Um, and it was to commemorate, of course, the, um, you know, the, the traveling in the wilderness of the Jews uh, in their tents. And they would remember that but it also would uh, point to when Jesus will come and rule and reign. And the Feast of Tabernacles, according to the book of Ezekiel and other places, is gonna be seen in the millennial kingdom as a celebration, which is uh, kind of interesting. You, so you, if you don't wanna be a tourist when you get to the millennial kingdom, you should definitely familiarize yourself with the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem during this time, but also he's coming from the miracle of feeding the 5,000. And after feeding the 5,000, um, he walked on water. We, we looked at that last week. And then he declared himself to be, in John chapter 6, the bread of life. The first of seven of the great I am statements of Jesus. These are the things we've covered in the previous couple of weeks. Um, but uh, we, it kind of left on a, a sad note last week because Jesus, after get, talking about the bread of life, um, talked about eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. And many of the disciples, not the, the, the 12, but the, the rest of them, they departed from Jesus at that point. They left, said, man, we can't follow this guy. He's talking about eating of his flesh and drinking his blood. So they rejected. Um, 
But um, in John chapter seven, we're gonna see kind of a different tune now. Jesus is gonna go into Jerusalem and we're gonna see during this Feast of Tabernacles, we're gonna see three, three times, uh, three sections of John chapter seven. If you like to divide chapters and kind of organize them, you might divide it, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles before the feast, uh, chapter seven, verses one through 10. And then in the midst of the feast or in the middle of the feast, uh, which is gonna be a debate uh, against the so-called scholars. And then there's the last day of the feast and we'll see uh, division. So before the feast, we're gonna see disbelief. Uh, in the middle of the feast, we're gonna see a debate. And then the last day of the feast, we're gonna see division. So the first section of this chapter, we're gonna call this section one, before the feast, and we're gonna see the disbelief, verses one through 10. Let's take a look. It says in verse one, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee for he would not walk in Jewry because of the Jews they sought to kill him. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Now, if you recall, why were they wanting to kill him? Uh, well, as it turns out, this is going back to the pool of Bethesda. Remember when Jesus healed the guy at the pool of Bethesda and he healed them, healed them on the Sabbath day. Um, and so they're holding that. They're saying, hey, he healed somebody on the Sabbath day, so we're gonna kill him. That's why they sought to kill him. Um, so Jesus is actually gonna sort of lay low here in Galilee. And this raises, uh, brings rise to some interesting, interesting questions that we might look at. But it goes on in verse three. It says, his brethren, therefore, said unto him, depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Does that sound like a little bit of a um, mean-spirited sort of attitude that they have toward Jesus? Um, who are the brethren that are being talked about here? Well, as it turns out, this shouldn't be controversial, but it is. Um, but the reason uh, it's controversial is because some made up stuff. Uh, first, let's decide who they are. We know this is Jesus's brothers. Now you say, who are these brothers? Literally his, what we might call his half brothers. So the debate, and it really isn't a debate, but Roman Catholicism says Jesus had no brothers or sisters. Now, the reason the Roman Catholics, if you were raised in that tradition, you know, you thought, well, Jesus never had any brothers, but the, the Bible actually says he did. So why does the Roman Catholics hang on, hang on to that with dear, for dear life? Uh, and they try to try to say stuff that's just nowhere in the Bible. Like for example, that Jesus um, had sort of stepbrothers or whatever, because Joseph was married before and he had some kids. Um, why, why do they say that? The Bible doesn't say anything about that. The reason is the Catholics really want to have a perpetual virgin as one of the doctrines of the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church is that um, uh, you know, Mary was perpetually a virgin. She never had any intimacy with a man ever. And so they, they have to kind of build that construct, even though the Bible says over and over again that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Um, you know, Matthew chapter 12, verse 46, maybe you recognize this. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Um, and they'll try to say, well, the Greek word for brethren, no, look it up. It's the Greek word for brothers, like literally siblings. Uh, it's, it's, don't try to do fancy stuff around this. In Matthew 13, 55 through 56, they said, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph, Simon and Judas or Jude and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? So um, we say technically they would be half brothers because Jesus was born of Mary, but not born of Joseph. Mary, of course, being the virgin birth was in fact true of the Bible. The Bible did say that, that's supported easily. So that's why we call these guys the half brother uh, of Jesus. Or the, uh, now we don't know the names of the sisters, by the way, but it says here, his brothers and his sisters, uh, which is kind of interesting. So the most natural conclusion one would just get by naturally reading the Bible uh, is to interpret that Jesus had actual, you know, blood half-siblings. 
Um, but the Roman Catholics kind of made it up because of their perpetual virginity uh, about Mary. One of the things you should be really careful with uh, is this idea of uh, the glorification, even sadly, the deification of Mary. They lift Mary up too high, I believe. Mary was an amazing girl, chosen of God, beloved of God, yes, but she was not deified or should not be deified. You shouldn't uh, use her as mediation through Mary, um, or praying to Mary or praying through Mary, depending on what kind of Catholic you are. Um, that's not in the Bible. That's just stuff people made up. Um, there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. So we have to be really careful. Go with what the Bible very clearly says. And this is one of those cases um, where uh, it's just really clear. Um, now, uh, by the way, Galatians 1.19, um, we also read, but other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. Um, this is uh, where we know that James was the brother of Jesus and also would eventually come around and believe. At this point in chapter seven, the brothers don't believe in him, which is kind of a shock because how would it be? Can you imagine how it would have been growing up with Jesus? I mean, literally having a perfect brother. Your mom always saying, man, I wish you'd just be more like Jesus. You know, it's like, that'd be a hard, that'd be really hard to be the brother. Maybe there was a little bitterness there because, you know, maybe they looked at Jesus as, you know, Mr. Goody Two Shoes or something. But he really was, like he was just good and never sinned. That'd be pretty tough being the brother or sister of the one who is perfect. Um, but they would come around and believe, just not at this point. So they're, they're sort of being like brother and sister. They're basically saying, Jesus, you know, stop being in secret. Make yourself known if you're the Christ. Um, you know, go down to Judea, which is Jerusalem, and, you know, do your thing. Uh, but, but Jesus is not going to do what they tell him to do. Um, so uh, some people might say, well, who are you, Pastor Brett, to call the Ch Catholic Church uh, wrong on this? Again, it's not me. I'm not the one calling out the Catholic Church. It's the Bible. The Bible is really clear. And the Bible is a bigger authority than the Roman Catholic Church. I hope you understand that. Um, and that's true of any church. The Bible is bigger than Athe Creek. The Bible is bigger than the Baptist Church, the Catholic Church, and all other churches combined. Um, if it's not in the word, watch out, be careful, stick with the Bible. I know that goes almost without saying, but it's amazing how many people are deceived by this. Well, back to this, you know, um, um, it, it could be the, all four of the brothers that we just read about, you know, James, Joseph, Sinus, Simon, Judas, um, maybe they didn't believe in Jesus. So they're kind of mocking him a little bit here, but look at verse six. Then Jesus said unto them, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. <laughs> what does he mean by that? My time is not yet come. Well, one thing about Jesus is he was always in sync with the Father in heaven. And he always did the will of his Father. Uh, the Father had a perfect timing and Jesus was perfectly in line with the timing of the Father. Um, he wasn't egged on by his brothers. Oh, you want me to show them some stuff in Jerusalem? Well, I'll show you. He didn't do that. He knew his time was not yet come. And Jesus, I wonder how many of us get prodded into doing stuff we shouldn't do just because people say, oh, you think you're that big a deal? Then do this. When really we should be doing whatever the Lord, the Father in heaven is leading us to do. Don't let people prod you. Um, human nature is to do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. That's just human nature. But Jesus displays here perfect submission to the Father in heaven, which is what we should also be displaying. You know, just don't get ahead of the Lord, but also don't lag behind the Lord, but find that perfect lockstep with the Lord is the, is the goal. Um, and so the, the key is, I think, for us to stop and pray and seek the Lord. Remember how many times Jesus went away and prayed in a quiet place? I wonder if that's just part of what he was doing, just, just syncing up, making sure he was in lockstep, in that way, what a beautiful picture that is for us. Um, you know, timing. The Lord's timing has a way of showing itself. People ask me, Pastor Brett, are you kind of worried about the legal proceedings with, you know, the, the, with the Clackamas County Building Department and all that stuff? And, you know, uh, and I'm not worried about that. Uh, we're working feverishly, and we have been for a couple of years on trying to get, you know, um, you know, fairness uh, and all that. But, um, but I, I'm convinced the Lord has his timing. 
I'm convinced. In fact, had we built the building that we were gonna build two years ago, um, I'm pretty sure it would have been too small. I, the, the leadership is all starting to say, maybe, we should, maybe the Lord's just you know, delayed this so that, so that we have maybe an opportunity to build a little bigger sanctuary than we were planning. Um, we don't really wanna do that. I, I, I still like the idea of a small church. Um, <laughs> But it's kind of what it is, you know. And in five services, um, man, the staff, the team, they do an awesome job. But that's hard work. Five services, I'm just going to say for the whole crew, Sunday school teachers and the parking lot people and the tech crew and, you know, just so many volunteers that make, it's, it's, it's quite a challenge. People are amazing that they're doing all that stuff. But, um, but it would be nice to, you know, uh, build a building that's appropriate. I kind of wonder, is the Lord orchestrating these things? By the way, we, uh, we've already won a victory. Um, the county, um, when they realized that they were in violation of the constitution, they, they, <laughs> they changed one of the laws in Oregon and they opened up a zone for church use, which that is from the, our lawsuit, which is kind of cool for other churches, um, especially, um, especially small churches that can't afford the giant lawsuit uh, against the county. Um, and so we kind of feel like even if nothing else happens from this, we feel like that was really kind of a blessing. Um, so um, anyway, uh, we'll fill you in more on that as we get closer to the what, when we find out any real answers. But I'm convinced the Lord has perfect timing. And we're just seeing that unfold, even though it's a little frustrating at times. Maybe it's not what I want, or maybe it's not the timing we think should happen. But boy, whether it's Athey Creek corporately or you individually, it's gonna be good if you're in sync and lockstep with the Lord. That's what Jesus perfectly models here. His, his brother's like, why don't you go down and show yourself in Jerusalem? He says, my, my hour has not yet come, or my time is, not. he said, your time is always ready. He's saying, you guys will do it whenever you want, is the idea there. Um, but he goes on in verse seven, um, the world cannot hate you, but it hateth me, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Why did they hate Jesus so much? Because Jesus was exposing their sin and their shortcomings. One of the mistakes the church in America is making, I believe, is we only want to talk about warm, fuzzy, happy, lovey, joyful stuff. I like talking about that stuff. I like talking about the mercy of God and God's grace. Oh, there's no greater topic to preach on than the grace of God, if you ask me. However, um, we, we as a church need to be like Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He spent a lot of time talking about what he was against. Maybe you'll read a book and you know, we're, we're a church that likes to talk about what we're for. We don't talk about what we're against. And so there's this death, death, deathly silent uh, behavior coming from the church when it comes to things like, you know, boys showering in the girls' locker room. Um, the, why is the church being silent about stuff like that? Uh, oh, we don't want to render unto Caesar what is Caesar and unto the Lord what is the Lord's. Yeah, but what about the unto the Lord what is the Lord's part? There, there's, there's, you know, there's two sides of that coin and well, Brett, that's just being political. No, that's being biblical. Um, we, we need to be careful. Uh, I don't want to talk about politics. I'm not, I don't want to do that. That's something I don't do here at, at Athey Creek, but I will talk about things that are biblical. And, uh, you know, whether you're talking about the transgender movement and wokeism and um, some of the stuff that's going on with the LGBTQ alphabet soup community, um, it's all in opposition to God and his holy word. It's, uh, abortion is something that's not political. Um, these are little lives being murdered in our culture. And someday we, uh, as a nation, I think we're gonna have to stand before God on this one. Um, but, but to be silent about this, I think is a mistake. It says here in our text, verse seven, the world cannot hate you, but me it hates because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. That's what Jesus did. That's why they hated him. He was exposing their own uh, sin. By the way, did, did Jesus come to condemn the world? No, he came to save them. But before you can save someone, they need to recognize their own sinful uh, you know, situation, that they're doomed apart from Jesus. That's what the whole Sermon on the Mount was about. Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. He said stuff like, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Um, and so you think, what's the purpose of the Sermon on the Mount? Well, the funny part of the Sermon on the Mount, remember, Jesus didn't give the answer to the, he just said, yeah, leave it there. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, well, then what's the answer to the Sermon on the Mount? Anybody remember? Jesus is the answer to the Sermon on the Mount because none of us would measure up. We all fall short. There's no one righteous, not even one. And so all that to say, man, the Lord uh, is the answer to our problem. So he didn't come to condemn, but he did come to convict the world of its sin. And that's what we're reading here in verse seven. So uh, as it turns out, uh, verse eight goes on, go ye up to this feast. I, uh, I go not up yet to this feast for my time is not yet full come. So Jesus has a specific timing when he's gonna go to the feast. And he says, I'm gonna go when I'm ready, uh, when I'm called, when I'm supposed to go. Um, so verse nine, when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then he also went up into the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Interesting, Jesus went up in secret, why? Well, I already told you, there's a perfect timing of when he's gonna reveal himself to be bold and he's gonna ultimately be uh, crucified on the cross because of that, right? But here's the question, is there ever a time to not be bold or to be a little more covert? See, th there's, there's some Christians, um, you know, that argue there's never a time to not be bold. There's never a time to, to be silent about your faith. And I would disagree with you on that. There's a time to speak and be bold, but there's also a time to get some work done. You know, um, uh, you know when I, before I was in ministry, I had the privilege of working for my dad a little bit in construction. And um, my dad, you know, some of the Christian guys that worked for him, you know, knew he was a Christian. So they thought, well, we can just stand around and fellowship and talk about Jesus. Uh, if they knew my dad, that was a very short-lived ministry. <laughs> because my dad's feeling was um, the most important thing you can do is be a really good worker and be a good testimony and, and you know, give honor to the, your employer and get work done, not just sit around and talk all day. And one of the things that, um, that I learned is that, you know, my dad would say, there's a time to speak and there's a time to be hardworking. And there's some times where maybe the Lord doesn't want you to, um, you know, be speaking out loudly, but to wait, there's a timing. Jesus is, do you think Jesus is fearful of these people? Of course not. Uh, Jesus is not afraid of these people, but he knows there's a time that he's supposed to be bold and there's a time where he needs to be silent and even in secret. Um, now that's gonna change here in a minute. He's gonna suddenly become really bold, but it was all about the timing. Um, I've, I've, I've had some Christians, oh, people just don't like me because I'm, I, I speak the, about my faith. And, um, and you know, when people do that, sometimes they, um, they, they're, they're moaning about something that's it's their own fault actually. And when, I, when, I, when I'm walking with the Lord at my job, I wanna, I wanna not sit around and complain or murmur about you know, <laughs> my, my own uh, people that don't like me because I'm a Christian. Um, that's, that, I think sometimes people say that, but they're actually not even, they're not even really accurate on that. Um, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're not disliked because you're being faithful, you're disliked because you don't like to be quiet. You might be disliked because you're kind of a weirdo. Um, I'm just being honest with you. You know, uh, your friends, you know, wounds of a faithful are the wounds of a friend. I'm your friend tonight. Some of you, is a time to be silent. Um, your best testimony at work, I think, is to be the best worker at your job, not necessarily taking breaks from work while talking about the Bible. That's kind of an important thing to think about. Now, I'm not arguing for not bold, but there's a time. And Jesus, this is, what does it say about him? He's, he's kind of being sort of in secret here. Uh, in verse 10, not openly, but as it were in secret. Now, um, but when it's time, have, have you ever wondered when is it time to speak boldly? I think the Holy Spirit stirs in your heart when it's time to speak boldly. Have you ever noticed that? Your heart starts beating. Um, man, you, 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 sometimes even your mind starts worrying. And... 
one of the things I've noticed is the Holy Spirit will speak things into your heart that you're supposed to speak with your mouth. The Lord puts those words in your mouth for you. Um, and I think there is a time where the Lord might have you be bold and you'll, you'll kind of know what it is, especially if you're in prayer and seeking the Lord, you'll know when it's time to speak up. And I think that's important. Well, we'll see that as it goes on. So Jesus were, uh, it says, uh, not openly, but as it were in secret. Now we get to the midst of the feast, the second uh, section of our study tonight. Um, and this is verses thir- 11 through 36. Um, and it's really a debate here. We see in verse 11, it says, then uh, the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, he is a good man. Others said, nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit, no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. So Jesus is the controversial subject of the day. Are there topics today you're afraid to speak of because it's so controversial? Uh, Man, I think that it's interesting. This Jesus happens to be the controversial topic here. Um, and so they're kind of being sort of quiet and covert about it. But some people are like, man, some think he's good. Some think he's bad. Well, who is he? So they're trying to get to the bottom of who Jesus is. Um, and, and by the way, when it comes to this um, talking about Jesus and, and being bold about your faith, um, you know, the one thing is when, when the Lord does want you to be bold, don't let fear dictate. Um, remember Proverbs 29, verse 25, where it says this, the fear of man brings a a snare, but whoso puts his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Um, So remember the snare is like a hook in the nose. (laughs) That's that's literally that idea. The Syrians bringing the Jews up to captivity. That's that snare. Fear of man is a hook in the nose is the idea, but whoso puts his trust in the Lord will be safe. Um, There might be some of you, boldness is not the problem, like I was talking about before, but fearfulness. When the Lord wants you to speak and be bold, you're silent because of fear. Uh, Watch out for that. There's no room for that as Christians. So back to point number two, it says in verse 14, now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled saying, how knoweth this man letters? having never learned. You know, letters means, uh, you know, he can read. Where did he learn to read? And where did, he, where did he get all this knowledge? He never went to Bible school or seminary or anything like that. Um, have you ever noticed, by the way, some of the best ministers and pastors and preachers uh, didn't actually go to seminary? Have you ever noticed that? It's actually a thing. You might check it out sometime. It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's one of the things that's uh, sad about our, our culture and the way the Christian church culture goes is um, you kind of don't want to hear anything unless a person went to seminary. Uh, sort of their, their credential. Brett, did you go to seminary? I did not go to cemetery. I mean seminary. <laughs> I, I did for a short time. I went and visited and was thinking about uh, enrolling at a seminary down in Southern California. Went there, visited, met some of the professors, when I realized half the professors didn't even believe in the inspired and infallible perfect word of God, I said, uh, no, not gonna go there. I got my degree in education. I'll tell you why I did that, by the way. Um, I was already working as a pastor. I, start, I got licensed and ordained at the young age of 17. And I was already ministering and working with a team of pastors and elders and learning from them for quite a few years already. Um, so I got my initial degree in education as a teacher, uh, graduated from the uh, miniature Berkeley, uh, Southern Oregon University. Um, but I did that mainly uh, because I liked teaching. Uh, I, liked, I liked working with kids. I did that for years as a children's pastor. Um, but I also looked at it as a tent making skill. You know, Paul had a thing where he could have a career and, and the church wasn't you know, didn't have to support him or pay his salary. He had a skill that he could tap into um, if he wanted to. And I kind of felt like I wanted that. Meanwhile, I'd rather continue ministering with guys who are already in the ministry, learning from them. And that's kind of where I got my, my training is 13 years of being uh, under a team of leaders uh, in a church that was growing and people were getting saved and baptized. It was a great education, honestly. Uh, So who did Jesus choose for his disciples? Did he choose the scholarly ones? Um, He chose the fishermen, 
That's what we chose. Now I'm not arguing for being stupid. I love, I love some of the scholars who went to seminary. I'm gonna give some seminarians some uh, perks here for you that are kind of uh, uh, mad at me right now because there, there are some seminarians who graduated who wrote the books and did the commentaries. Like I lean heavily on those guys. I like some of those guys that have done that work. But the, the most successful of those guys aren't necessarily meant to be a pastor of a church. Uh, they're just great scholars who've done some heavy lifting. And, and then we pastors, we can sort of bring the hay down from the loft. Does that make sense? And, and that's some of my favorite pastors over the years. I've noticed those are the guys who lean heavily on the men who were truly scholars um, and went to all the studies in school, Greek, Hebrew, all the language studies, but, um, but have a, sh- a shepherding heart is kind of the idea there. Um, you say, well, Brett, what about Paul the apostle? Um, uh, by the way, remember in Acts chapter four, verse 13, the, the intellectual guys looked at the disciples and, says, and they marveled that they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they took note that they'd been with Jesus. That's pretty cool. Um, uh, but Paul the apostle, uh, do you remember what he said about all his degrees? He counted them, but what? Somebody said rubbish. You guys are trying to be nice and uh, polite. Yeah, manure. Dung. Uh, that's what he called it. He, he, in Philippians 3, 8, he says, man, I, you know, I've suffered loss for all things and I do count them but dung that I may win Christ. So schooling is good, important learning. If, you, if you're a person who learns really well by yourself and by reading and learning, that's great. Um, however, um, it's not a requirement for you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to go to seminary or Bible school. I, I feel like we've done a disservice to the congregation of, of, of Christ. Because some of you think, well, Brett, that's your job. You're the, the preacher of the gospel and you're the one who's supposed to be telling everybody about Jesus. No, no, no. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and have ordained you, the Bible says, about all of us. You've been ordained to serve as Christians who share the good news. So important to understand, what is more beneficial? Um, you know, I think just to love Jesus, to know his word, to study, but you don't have to have a, a degree necessarily. And, and, and there's a dangerous uh, thing here because, um, because the smartest guys in this room are gonna be the, making the dumbest decisions. Let's notice that in this story. So they're marveling, verse 15. Uh, how does this guy know anything? You know, he doesn't even, he's never really learned. Now you, you might say, well, Brett, he's Jesus. He's God in the flesh. Um, true, true. And, and uh, that is hard to compare. But how did Jesus get all of his knowledge, they're asking? Well, verse 17, it says, Jesus answered them and said, my, 16, verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Now, this is where we're getting introduced to a word that's important, the word doctrine. Uh, What is it? It's the Greek word uh, that you might want to take note because this comes up in the Bible. Um, But it's didache, uh, which means teaching or instruction. Um, And notice uh, something that people miss. This word doctrine in the Greek, didache, which it's singular, it's not plural. Um, There's sort of what you might call the teaching that is truth and right and good. And Jesus is saying, my doctrine, singular, is not mine, but his that sent me. The reason I point out the singular is whenever you see the word doctrines with a plural, um, it's always kind of in the negative. You know, there's, there's a few examples of that. For example, do you remember in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, end times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So they're teachings, plural, of devils. Boy, is that happening today? I think we're living in the last days just from what 1 Timothy 4.1 tells us. Um, so doctrines is plural there. Another example is Colossians 2.22, where it says, you know, um, th- those things which are all to perish um, with the using after the commandments and the doctrines of men. Uh, this is another negative. Um, but when Jesus talks about doctrine, it's singular. There's a single truth, a singular teaching that's all based on truth. So it's something to kind of be careful of and watch out for. So doctrine. Uh, now, 
Uh, back to point two here, verse 17, it goes on. My doctrine is not mine, but him that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeks his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true and no unrighteousness is in him. Uh, Jesus did not speak of himself. That's an important thing. Boy, that's something, you know, we pastors, we, you know, are we talking too much about ourselves? Jesus didn't speak of, now he did sort of speak of himself, but um, only um, at the most important times. You know, one of the autobiographical statements Jesus made in Matthew eleven twenty-nine, 29, he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am what? Do you remember? Meek and lowly in heart. Um, and you shall find rest in your souls. That was a statement about himself. But he wasn't saying that to really glorify himself, but he spoke of himself so that the Father would be glorified. That's, that's kind of the thing. Um, so we should be careful not to make it all about ourselves. But when you do speak of yourself, hopefully it's for the purpose of glorifying the Father. That's what Jesus did. Um, by the way, speaking of yourself, uh, it's a great thing to share your testimony with people what the Lord has done. If you're just sharing your testimony to let people know, wow, you're amazing, then you're doing it wrong. But if you're sharing your testimony to say, look what God has done in my life, um, that can be powerful. Um, and uh, we need to have that attitude we learned about a few weeks ago, back in John chapter three, verse 30, when John the Baptist said, he must increase, I decrease. That's what he said. Well, verse 19 goes on. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet, None of you keepeth the law. Why go you about to kill me? <laughs> now, now this is, don't miss this. Jesus is throwing down right here. If you didn't, if you didn't catch that, this is big. Uh, he's like, you know, he's saying, you guys, and he's talking probably to the Pharisees. Do you remember the Pharisees? They were known for keeping the law. They're the ones that counted out their spices and their uh, cumin and thyme and salt and pepper. You know, nine pieces for me, one piece for the Lord. And they were so seemingly righteous, these Pharisees. And they, they claimed to be keepers of the law. But Jesus is saying, you know, you guys, you, you think you're keeping the law, but none of you are keeping the law. He's calling them out. Um, by the way, has anybody ever been saved in the history of the earth by keeping of the law? No. Um, you know, Jesus is the only one who perfectly fulfilled the law. But um, even if you broke one point, the Bible tells us of the law, you're guilty of the whole thing. So these Pharisees, they knew, they, they had to know in their heart of hearts, oh, we try to keep the law. But there were some problems. In fact, Jesus is gonna call out some problems with their law because they're probably thinking, we keep the law perfectly. Um, but then he also says, why are you trying to kill me? None of you have kept the law perfectly. Um, so why are you trying to kill me? Well, verse 20, the people answered and said, thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. He's, they're saying, you got a devil. And by the way, who's, who's trying to kill you? Well, if you remember, there's been a couple times uh, we left off, you know, last week where they were ready to stone him with rocks. Um, there's a couple times where they've sought to kill him so far. Um, so they're like, who's trying to kill you? And Jesus, verse 21, answered and said unto them, I have done one work and ye all marvel. Uh, what, what work is he talking about? The work, he's probably referring to the work of healing the guy on the Sabbath day, the pool of Bethesda, because that was the work that they were all wanting to kill him over. Um, you know, and so he goes on, he says, I've done one work and you marvel, verse 22, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because of it is of Moses, but because of fathers, of the fathers. And you on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. He's saying, use logic. Just use good judgment here, fellers. You guys, what, what, what do you, he's saying, I healed a guy who was, was crippled and he got up and walked away on the Sabbath. And, and he said, you guys circumcise a guy on the Sabbath. Now, this is where, uh, this is kind of funny because 
circumcision is a work that they have to do. Um, but what happens, you know, they had to do it on the eighth day. So um, what happens if a child is born and it just so happens he's supposed to be circumcised on the Sabbath day? Um, as it turns out, it looked like they, they did it. Jesus said, you guys do that. What about that? Now, do you think Jesus is really concerned about them circumcising the baby on the Sabbath? It's not about that, but it's their self-righteousness and they don't have a good answer for this. That's the point of this. Um, you know, what's more important, cutting away the, the flesh uh, in circumcision or being made whole in the sight of the Lord? And Jesus is saying, just use logic, good, use good judgment here. Um, they had lost good judgment when it came to the Sabbath. Uh, they made all kinds of crazy rules that had nothing to do with the heart behind the Sabbath. We've done whole studies on that, so I'm gonna leave that there. But verse 25, then said some of them of Jerusalem, is not this he whom they seek to kill? Now, now get, kind of get the picture. There's a bunch of people in Jerusalem. He's talking to religious leaders. He's talking to his brothers at the beginning of this chapter. Who are these people? These are just the people that live in Jerusalem. They're the locals. Um, they're not necessarily the religious leaders, but they're people that live in Jerusalem. They've been seeing all the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, and now they're gonna pipe in here. They're saying, um, they're saying, is this not he whom they seek to kill? But lo, verse 26, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Oh, they're showing promise here. The inhabitants of Jerusalem are like, man, there's something about this guy. Is he really the Messiah? But look at verse 27. Howbeit, we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knows whence he is. Now, this is where you can lose it in the King James language. The problem is they're saying, we think he could be the Christ, only we know where he's from, so he can't be the Messiah. Well, why would they say that? Well, it has to do with the prophecy from Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 8. Um, the reference here is that classic prophecy concerning the Messiah. In this passage, the Jews understood Isaiah the prophet to say no one would know from whence the Messiah really came. But these guys are going, well, we know he's from Nazareth of Galilee. But here's a question. Were they right about that? No. Even if you want to be technical on the earth, he wasn't even from Nazareth. He was from Bethlehem, which is a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. But I'm not even sure that's what he's talking about. Isaiah's saying the people won't even know where he's from. Where was Jesus ultimately from? Heaven. Um, he came down from glory and became a man and lived among us. Um, uh, you know, they thought he was from Galilee. He was technically from, from, uh, from Bethlehem. But Jesus is gonna say, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Check this out. Um, this, is, this is the big statement here in verse 28. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, now pause. It's not that he's crying like weeping sadly. Um, the crying means that he's suddenly declaring with a loud, profound, powerful public declaration. That's, that's the word, like a crier. You know, like he's crying out boldly is the idea here. The reason this is important, because remember, he's been secret in Jerusalem up until this point, like just kind of laying low. Now he stands up and he's boldly going to make a declaration. Look at this. It says here, um, back in our, our text, uh, it says, Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me, um, and you know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. What, what did he say? What was he saying to these guys? Jesus' point is, you don't know me because you don't know my father. You think you know who I am, but you don't know my father. Boy, this is, this is sad that the people of Jerusalem, they, they're so out of touch. They don't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, here's an important doctrine of the Bible. Um, you don't know the Father without knowing the Son. If you claim to be a spiritual person and, oh yeah, I love God, I believe in God, uh, you know, sort of the Oprah Winfrey sort of belief, kind of a new age, I just believe in God. And, you know, Jesus was a great teacher and a prophet, but so was Muhammad and Buddha and Krishna and Confucius. If you, if you don't know Jesus is the Messiah, then you do not know the true God. That's a doctrine of the Bible. Um, be careful on this one. That's what Jesus is saying here. If, you know, 
I know him, but you do not know him. That's what he's saying. So at this point, they're mad. They seek to lay hands on him, but his hour's not yet come. So verse 31, it says, and many of the people believed on him and said, when Christ cometh, he will do more miracles than, uh, than these which this man hath done. And the Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, yet a little while I am with you and then I will go unto him that sent me. You shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. Brett, is this a contradiction? Because later Jesus is gonna say in John chapter 14, verse six, that I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Well, this tells us something about the people he's talking to here. The people John, in John 14 are saved Christians who believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So they get to be with him. These people are gonna reject Jesus so they do not get to follow him. They will not go to that place we would call heaven. That's why he says, you will not come. That where I am, you cannot come. It's because of their unbelief. I hope you see that. It's kind of important. Verse 35, then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this, that he said, you shall seek me and shall not find me and where I am thither you cannot come. Um, Jesus, uh, the, the, the answer to their question, yes, he's gonna go to the Gentiles, but he's talking about heaven. Jesus is gonna be crucified. He's gonna raise from the dead and he will send into heaven. And they didn't understand that he was talking about heaven. Then they asked Jesus the question, uh, and Jesus is now gonna answer. And now we're on the last day of the feast. This is the third section and final section of this chapter. So you get, you the, 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 before the feast, disbelief. In the midst of the feast, a big debate. Who is this guy? Who, where does he come from? Is he the Christ? But now we're gonna see division on the last day of the feast, verses 37 to the end. It says in verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Um, this reminds me a little bit of Jesus, the word we saw last Sunday in John chapter eight, where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Here is the same sort of declaration he made to the woman at the well of Samaria in John chapter four about the living water. But in this case, Jesus is talking very specifically about this. Now, now there's something about the last day of the feast that most of us Gentiles kind of miss. And this is pretty fun. In the last day of the great feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, um, there was a tradition where the priests, several of them, would walk down with these big golden containers and they'd walk from the Temple Mount down the Southern Steps. So if you've been to Israel with me, we've gone up the, su the Southern Steps. Um, we were at the lowest point, Pool of Siloam, right after we got out of Hezekiah's Tunnel. If you're remembering our trip, this is all part of our Israel trip. Uh, but you, we come out of the Hezekiah's Tunnel and we end up at the Pool of Siloam. The priests on the last day of Feast of Tabernacles would go down there with these big golden vessels and they would dip them in the pool and they would carry them up the hill, back up the Southern steps through the hold the gates that are now sealed. But they would then go in and they would pour out those, those, um, those vessels uh, onto the Temple Mount. Uh, now, why would they do this? It was, it, was, um, it, was, it was something they did as they sang a couple songs uh, of the Old Testament and it had to do with their ritual Linked to Isaiah 12, verses two and three. Let me just show you where that is. A couple scriptures. They would sing this as a song, Isaiah 12, two and three. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord, Jehovah, is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. They would sing this you know, song of Isaiah when they would carry these up on the last day of the feast of tabernacles. Then they would also sing Isaiah 44 verses one through four. This is another one that's interesting. As they're carrying water, they're singing, here now, yet, yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, who I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, 
uh, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon my, uh, the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water course, uh, courses. Okay, Brett, got it. So they sang these songs. What's that have to do with anything? Well, interesting. Jesus is um, declaring himself to be on the very day that they would haul this water up and they would pour it out to be a commemoration of this. Now, now as, as Christians, we know Isaiah the prophet is speaking of this very thing that Jesus is declaring of himself. This is a prophetic word from Isaiah talking about the Messiah, Jesus. Now, there's a thing that they did that's kind of interesting. They would carry the last of the buckets that they'd carry up. It was empty. And the reason they would pour that out, they'd pour out all the other ones and water would splash onto the Temple Mount. But the final one they poured would be empty. Why? Because they were commemorating that the Messiah had not yet come. And it was just a, a way of showing uh, that they were expecting to have this sort of messianic promise of Isaiah to be fulfilled. Do you remember what Jesus was called uh, by Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians 10.4? Um, you can remember this, 10.4, Roger. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.4, it says, and they did drink of the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Remember the rock that was smitten by Moses and water gushed forth? Paul is saying that rock was Jesus Christ. So they'd continue bringing these containers up, but the, the last container they would pour it out and it'd be nothing. I just wonder, I can't prove this biblically, but I'm just raising the question. You can check it out when we get to heaven. But I wonder if Jesus says verse 37, right as they're pouring out that empty vessel. I just wonder. It'd just be kind of a perfect symbol. They're pouring out, okay, we're waiting for the Messiah. And then Jesus cries out with a loud voice, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Whether they dumped that out at that moment or not, I don't know for sure. But Jesus is talking about something deep here, that there's a satisfaction that comes from Jesus, the living water. But in this case, he's speaking concerning the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is uh, pictured by living water as well. When Jesus rose up into heaven, he didn't just leave us alone, but he uh, would allow his comforter, uh, to uh, come and, and in, in place of him, if you would. Remember when Jesus uh, said this in John 16, seven? He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away. In other words, it's gonna be good that I'm leaving, ascending into heaven. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Um, this is what Jesus is talking about here, the water, living water. How do I know? Well, verse 39 it says in verse 39, but this spake he of the spirit, which they that believed on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Um, by the way, the ministry of the spirit is to glorify Jesus. Jesus was not yet glorified. He hadn't uh, risen from the dead yet. He hadn't ascended into heaven. And he was not in his glorified state. But the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus. Jesus. Um, John 14, John 16 says that. One of the things we have to be careful of, church family, is not to be all about the Holy Spirit because when we realize what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit points us to Jesus Christ. He will glorify me, Jesus said. Um, if a church is all about glorifying the Holy Spirit, hey man, we got the Holy Ghost. And we're gonna have a Holy Ghost happening. And we're gonna have a Holy Ghost night. We're gonna have Holy Ghost and Holy Ghost and Holy Ghost. If a church is only about that, could they be missing the point of the Holy Spirit is to point to the Son. Read John, 13, uh, John 14 uh, and John 16, very important. But this is where Jesus is saying, he's speaking of the Spirit, uh, which was gonna come after he's glorified. Well, we go on here in verse 40. It says, many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying said, of a truth, this is the prophet. Um, does anybody remember, we talked about this last week, what's the prophet they're referring to, anybody? Maybe the Messiah, perhaps, but maybe not. Who is the prophet that they're talking about? Anybody know? Elijah, you're getting hotter. 
Do you remember in Deuteronomy chapter 18, this is important, verses 15 and 16, this is where Moses spoke of that prophet that would come. Now there's debate, was that prophet Jesus? Um, some people argue that that prophet would be all the prophets that came after Moses, prophet after prophet. But um, perhaps most scholars agree that the, that prophet was speaking of John the Baptist of all people. And then he would be the, the one telling us of Jesus, the Messiah. Um, Jesus did sort of move in a ministry of, of the word, of a, like a prophet in that way, but we know Jesus is more than a prophet. So, um, so when, when people said that, like, like when we talked about when they, Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And then some people say you're that prophet. Well, that's Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 16. You can look at that and see what um, Moses was referring to there. But um, in, in a sense, what you have to understand is these people weren't necessarily saying that prophet, meaning the Messiah. They had it in their mind there was a prophet coming who would sort of be a forerunner before the Messiah. That's why many people believe they're referring to uh, John the Baptist. So something for you to think about. Um, but you can do your own study on that. But um, again, who do you say Jesus is? He claimed to be the son of the living God. Um, these people are saying, maybe he's that prophet. Verse 41, others said, this is the Christ. See the differentiation there? So there's some are saying that prophet, some are saying the Messiah. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? Do you see how they're hung up right now with where Jesus was from? It's because of that Isaiah passage that basically said that they would not know from whence he came. The Isaiah said that, but they're thinking he's from Galilee. So they're, they're ruling out Jesus as an option for the Messiah because of their misconceived idea a misconception about where he was from. Boy, I hope people don't miss the Messiah, Jesus, because of their preconceived ideas of what they think Jesus is supposed to be. You gotta go with what the Bible says. These people were not doing that. So they're like, man, uh, but shall Christ come out of Galilee? Verse 42, hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now you think Jesus, a little clarification, I was born in Bethlehem, hello. You guys sharpen up a little bit here. It's like, no, Jesus doesn't even do that. They're just hung up on the wrong thing. So there was division. That's why we call this section the, the last day of the feast where there's division. Um, well, verse 44, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees and they said to them, why have you not brought him? And the officers answered, never man spake like this man. <laughs> Don't you love this? Um, now, how are they gonna respond to that? Uh, it says, verse 47, then answered them, the, um, the Pharisees, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. These are the intellectuals saying, you know nothings. You guys don't know what you're doing. Man, if you guys are fooled, are even there Pharisees that are fooled? And then the next word is, verse 50, Nicodemus. <laughs> now, do you remember Nick, Nick at night? Nicodemus, uh, we, we learned, went and talked to Jesus. Now, I don't believe Nicodemus is necessarily saved at this point. I do believe he does become saved. He's there at the tomb with Joseph of Arimathea, and he's one of the Pharisees that actually I, I think is gonna follow Jesus. But Nicodemus is gonna speak up. Are, are even our Pharisees starting to be duped by this guy? And then Nicodemus uh, over here, he says, verse uh, 50, he said unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, by one, uh, being one of them, one of the Pharisees, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? Nicodemus, the Pharisee, um, actually is, is saying, man, you, you gotta understand, we have a law that we're supposed to go by. By the way, did you know the Constitution of the United States, contrary to what you'll hear in your colleges and universities, many of the ideas and notions that came about our formation of our country and our government came from biblical themes. And one of the biblical themes, as it turns out, um, is you're not supposed to convict a person without a trial. And you're supposed to uh, presume someone's innocent um, unless they're proven guilty 
that's 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 theoretically the way it's supposed to be here in the United States. Um, but these guys, you know nothings, are even the, the Pharisees being duped. And then Nicodemus stands up and says, yeah, but are you gonna convict this guy without even a trial? Um, uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, they're rejecting Jesus because of their so-called great intellect. Can I remind you, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 27, for you see your calling, brethren, how not, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. We have that displayed fully here in John chapter seven, where the brilliant thinkers, the religious guys, they're saying, what? Are you so stupid that you're listening to what this guy said? But sadly, they're, they're showing their own foolishness. Um, not many wise uh, are called after the flesh. That's what we're seeing here. So Nicodemus stands up for Jesus and says, man, are you gonna convict him without really giving him a trial? Um, and then verse 52, they answered and said unto him, art thou also of Galilee? Now, you have to understand, they're calling Nicodemus a Galilean. You say, well, so what? Do you understand? That's, that's like, you know, maybe uh, the most insulting thing you could say. They, the Jews thought the people of Galilee were backwoods hicks hillbillies. Um, and they said, they said, Nicodemus, are you, you must be from Galilee too, you big dummy. That's what they're saying to him. Um, Nicodemus uh, uh, was not a dummy, but he wasn't duped as much as these guys. Um, and then they said unto him, search and look for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Interesting that these intellectuals are saying, are you from Galilee, Nicodemus, you weirdo? Um, they're insulting him. And they're like, and, and but do your own study. Has any good thing come from Galilee? And especially, has there been any prophet? Um, did you know that there were, was definitely a prophet that came out of Galilee? Uh, maybe you didn't know this, um, but 2 Kings, jot it down in your notes right next to this verse. 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25 tells us that perhaps you might even call him one of the most successful prophets. I'm not saying I like this prophet, but who was the most successful prophet in the Old Testament? Probably Jonah. I mean, Jonah, like, you gotta love Jeremiah, but you can't really call him successful. Not one person listened to a word he said. I love jo Jeremiah, but Jonah, he half-heartedly, he doesn't even wanna go to Jonah. He runs, or to Nineveh. He runs the other way, and the Lord, you know, you know the story. He gets swallowed by a big fish, barfed on the beach, and then he walks in half-digested, and he's just reluctant to say, okay, whatever, like, uh, you know, repent of your sins, and the whole city repents. And then he goes off and pouts about it. It's an amazing story, the story of Jonah. But as it turns out, the most successful prophet, he, the whole town, of, the whole, the whole uh, civilization of Nineveh, the Assyrians, uh, were saved by that preaching. But guess what? First King, pardon me, 2 Kings 14, 25 says that Jonah was from Galilee. So these guys didn't even know they By the way, there's, there's possibly others. Some say Elijah the prophet was originally from Galilee. There's evidence. I don't have time to go into that. Another one, some have suggested that Nahum the prophet. Um, can anybody guess why Nahum was uh, perhaps from Galilee? Anybody want to guess? Have you ever heard of the town Capernaum? Some say that Nahum must have been from that town and that was their claim to fame. Uh, house of Nahum, a uh, place where he was from. So I wouldn't die on that battlefield for sure, but that's what some of the Jews believed. So chances are, for, we know for sure Jonah was from Galilee, maybe Elijah, maybe Nahum, but these guys, they just don't know what they're talking about. They're showing their own ignorance and blinded by their false security and their so-called intellect or their knowledge, they're totally messed up. This is where I started tonight's study, intellectualism can be a false god, and you gotta be careful about this. Um, I'd rather be numbered of, uh, in like what we read about there in 1 Corinthians, you know, um, chapter one, verses 20. I'd rather be numbered among the foolish things of the world than to be uh, numbered among the wise and the mighty. If the wise and the mighty keeps me from knowing Jesus Christ, I'd be rather numbered among the foolish and the ignorant. Um, you know, Jesus talked about how you must become like a little child to enter the kingdom. These intellectuals are unwilling to do that. 
So they're just mocking everybody. They're running to kill Jesus and they're mocking Nicodemus. And it says, you know, verse 53 ends with this. Every man went to his own house. Jesus, verse one of chapter eight, went unto the Mount of Olives. What a sad ending of this chapter. There's, there's all this stuff that happened, you know. We've got the, you know, Feast of Tabernacles, which is supposed to be a beautiful demonstration of God and his provision and the future coming of Christ. But it ends with the people going their way and Jesus going up on his way on the Mount of Olives. Um, we're gonna pick it up next week. But can I just warn you, and can we watch and be careful that we don't find ourselves letting our intellect block just that radical faith in knowing Jesus Christ. Their intellect let them down in chapter seven. They thought they knew stuff, but as it turns out, they knew nothing. And because of that, they're doomed. Because of that, it seems that Jesus identifies these people in this chapter that when he said, you know, I'm gonna go to heaven, but you're not gonna be able to go where I am because they're gonna not really be those who believe. But the believer gets to John 14 and says, that where I am, there you may be also. That's the difference. The intellect who's gonna try to stand on his own, doomed, um, but the person who has childlike faith, believing in Christ, saved. That's why you must become like a little child. Well, all that to say, we have a lot of work to do here still in John chapter eight as we come up to that next week. Let's pray together. Lord, we're so thankful for uh, this chapter. It's sad to see just human nature on display um, of of uh, sort of intellectual doubt, thinking that we're smarter than we really are. We see that propensity within all of us. Um, but I pray that we'd have that childlike faith. But Lord, help us not to get caught up in the intellectualism, but just to learn and grow in our knowledge of who you are. Lord, may our understanding of your word just grow as we study the scripture. May we know you better as we study these passages. And your word tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word. So may our faith be built up tonight as we've spent this time in chapter seven. Bless these, your people, as we go our way tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.